Uh, we're thrilled to have Bishop Vaughn McLaughlin with us uh, today, the full day. He's uh, preached in chapel this morning uh, and then uh, on the forum. And I've asked uh, uh, Bishop McLaughlin if he just share a little bit more about um, all these uh, nooks and crannies that the church has kind of seeped into uh, under his ministry in Jacksonville. As I uh, introduced him in chapel, you're with me. He's the founding pastor and the senior pastor at Potter's House Christian Fellowship, uh, uh, founded uh, in a, a small group of 40 in 1988, now over 5,000 people in Jacksonville, uh, and uh, a remarkable account of all the ways in which the church has uh, influence the social fabric of the city. Uh, and that's what I've asked uh, Vaughn to share about. And we'll see a, a video in a moment. A Christian academy has grown uh, from the church. Uh, a, a large set of malls has grown under the umbrella of the church's ministry to train uh, individuals uh, uh, in an enormous array of job skills, uh, uh, too many ministries to mention, although you'll see a lot of them uh, here in the video uh, briefly. Uh, we made a mention because it is now a famous place in Jacksonville, the Soul Food Bistro, uh, uh, now in three and now maybe four, uh, coming four locations uh, uh, acclaimed uh, across uh, the southeast uh, a remarkable testimony to the diverse ways in which God's people demonstrate their commitment uh, to Christ. Uh, you'll hear uh, a little bit more about uh, uh, the bishop's uh, work with other pastors around the globe, uh, the way in which the church is to be united uh, across diverse cultures, languages, tribes, nations, and tongues. Uh, and so uh, it's just a delight uh, 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 Bishop has been a wonderful friend uh, to our Jacksonville campus. Uh, if you uh, ever get a chance uh, to be in Jacksonville, you not only want to visit the Potter's House ministry, but you also want to visit campus and hear the testimony of uh, uh, the Bishop's presence uh, there and all that he has meant uh, for us at Gordon-Conwell. I, I mentioned in the introduction in chapel, uh, he is an inveterate learner, uh, curious uh, from the beginning of his days, uh, and uh, he is a graduate. We do count him as one of our own in many ways, uh, and yet uh, it is uh, he who has influenced far more, I'm sure, than we have influenced uh, him. Uh, and so uh, without much more, let me uh, uh, start the video, which will give you a kind of brief window into this remarkable ministry at the Potter's House Fellowship in Jacksonville, and really as it touches uh, the globe as well. And then uh, we'll let uh, uh, Bishop McLaughlin uh, take the stage. We'll get the lights, and then the video. The Potter's House had its beginning in 1988. 30 plus people gathered and set in motion what is now the internationally acclaimed Potter's House International Ministries. The ministry began being externally focused and is always taking care of the total needs of the total man. By meeting the felt needs of each community that the ministry has resided in, the Potter's House has garnered the reputation as a transformational church. Charisma Magazine featured the church in its cover story calling the article, The Church That Changed the City. The church entered a dilapidated and crime infested area of Jacksonville and has brought life and restoration back to a community for people to dwell in. The church has a mandate to meet the needs of all that it comes in contact with. The ministry's impact is felt educationally, socially, economically, and of course, spiritually. The ministry has purchased over $50 million worth of property spanning over 100 commercial acres on the west side of Jacksonville, a vacant car dealership and repair shop, a former Bell South International phone center that was opened and named the Potter's House Multiplex. It became home to the academy, the ministry offices, and a mini mall and incubator that housed the renowned Potter's House Credit Union, dry cleaning, the Greyhound Bus Terminal, gift shops, men's clothing, law offices, beauty salon, barber shops, game room, 
in the original Potter's House Cafe, now known as the Potter's House Soul Food Bistro. It also housed the dance studio, a public banquet facilities, and much, much more. The ministry has purchased 33 acres of prime property for the future development of a municipal sports complex, a new location for the Potter's House Christian Academy, and senior affordable housing and assistant living facilities. But the most recent and daunting of all purchases was the 400,000 square foot former Normandy Mall, now home to the church and office facilities as well as the Kingdom Plaza Mall. This facility was vacant for over 15 years and is now the epicenter of Jacksonville's West Side. The mall is owned and operated by the church itself and is also anchored by the church-owned businesses of Kingpin's Bowling Center, a 22-lane bowling alley, one of the city's most popular, with bowling leagues and youth activity that makes it a great hangout for the community. Temple Builders Fitness Center, a state-of-the-art 14,000-square-foot fitness center with the latest and most high-tech fitness equipment in town. The only fitness center on the west side of Jacks with an indoor pool and jacuzzi, steam room, and wet and dry room. Temple Builders serves as a bridge for the community. It brings the young and the old together, and it crosses cultural boundaries, bringing people together to reshape the temples God has given them. And then there's the nationally acclaimed Soul Food Bistro, one of Jacksonville's most popular restaurants. With two locations, one on the beach and one on the west side, people come from 120 mile radiuses to enjoy the food and festive atmosphere. Many awards have been bestowed upon Bishop McLaughlin and the ministry for his accomplishments in their efforts to fight crime, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and take care of the sick and afflicted. The outreach ministries of the Potter's House flow from the church and from both the west side and north side locations. And the Potter's House has transformed the west side of Jacksonville and hopes to model this type of ministry as it continues to do so in this new millennium. Right, New England. <laughs> For those of you that were in the chapel, I'd get the revelation after I left, after I talked about England. I forgot this is New England. <laughs> so I got you now. A little bit like a heavyweight fight. You got to feel your way. Find out where you are. Round two. Ding. <laughs> Listen, guys, I hope that that video, I asked Rick to play the video because often when you talk about some of the things that God has done through you, and God is doing with you. Sometimes if people have never seen it, it sounds like you're just both bragging and, and, uh, and just talking about yourself and talking about things that people can't visualize and people can't see. The 12 spies that were sent into the promised land, uh, they were sent in to see if it was if, just like it was if God said it was, if it was like God said. And they came back and they brought some of the stuff back and they showed everybody and they said, it's just like God said, here are the pomegranates, here the, look at the grapes, look at this stuff. But yet they didn't have the faith to believe that they could accomplish the things that God had purposed them to accomplish. And so they wandered for another 40 years. So many people in the body of Christ today, so many local churches are not transforming their communities, are not making an impact in their communities because they, I don't know, they just don't believe. They just don't believe that it's as if God said, even though they've seen it. So one of the things I try to do is I try to not just talk about it, and I'm going to just give you a little preview of my life. I do not practice what I preach. And so many people tell me that. I actually preach what I practice. And so the deal is the power is in the manifestation. It's me telling you that God has done this and then showing you that God has done it and letting you know that God has no respect of persons and that maybe the transformation of a community like this meeting the felt needs of a community is biblical. Maybe it is what God intends for the church to be. I'm writing a book, uh, it's called Mega uh, Church, with church slashed out and then impact put there. Not mega church, but mega impact. You can take 12 and turn the world upside down and one of them be a devil. And so we can take our small churches, regardless of the size, and have an impact. And how do you have that impact? By meeting the felt needs of a community. Everything that you saw 
on the screen now with over 250 full-time employees that are hired from the community. 25% of them are ex-felons, people who don't have an opportunity in life, people who have been written off, uh, and we take them, and we uh, don't have to come to know Christ. You have to come to work. And, uh, and we help you build uh, a resume for future employment, but we put you in a safe environment where you can come in supervised by mature spiritual people in an environment that is protected, I believe, by prayer. And God has kept us over the years, in the uh, 30 years that we've been in ministry and started this ministry, um, we've been able to just go into each community as we grew, we expanded, we grew, we expanded. And when we get into that community, we immediately begin to assault the blight. Now, keep in mind, my testimony is written, it's plain. I've shared it from CBN to TBN and all over the country, Daystar, that I was a non-church guy. And so at 26 years old, I had never read a Bible. I had never heard a sermon. The first preacher I heard preach was uh, um, Jimmy Swagger. And he had a long cord and a microphone this long. And he was popping it. And he was like a cowboy. And I said, look at the cowboy preaching. I thought it was like a, a comedic thing. I didn't know what it was. But I heard him say something like, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And when he said die, we're like, oh, he's serious. What does he mean die? And that piqued my curiosity. I remember in college on the campus of the University of Tennessee, there were people that would hand tracks to me, and, and I would see them, and I got to know them, and I would see them coming, and I would run. The girls with the peanut butter stockings on, with the furniture doilies on their head, with the long dresses on, I would see them, and I would go running the other way because I knew they were going to hand me a track. And I'll never forget the day they handed me a track, Dennis, and I took it, and I found me some marijuana, and I rolled me a track of marijuana. <laughs> And didn't know that the paper was on fire, and I sucked, and the fire just went down in my. I, I, I'm not going to hell, but I sure felt like I had visited. That was hurting. But anyway, God was planting seeds, planting seeds, planting seeds, planting seeds, planting seeds. And then one day, my best friend from college, Alvin Smalls, all American football player, uh, he got saved, he came to play with the Jacksonville Bulls, the USFL. And I read in the paper that he was there, Buck Ballou, Brian Sight and Matt Robinson and Alvin Small. And I went out there to see him, and when I got to the Gator Bowl, he came out after practice, and he had his playbook like everybody else, but on top of his playbook, he had this huge black book, and it was a Bible. And I had rolled the joint. I, I'm sorry, joint's going to come up every now and then. And I came to see him with the fifth of tequila, with the T-tops off my Trans Am. I was making six figures at 24 years of age, uh, operations manager for the world's largest railroad. And as I came towards him, he saw me and he started smiling. And I said, what's wrong with Squidly? He's smiling. He says, man, I've been praying for you. I serve a new Lord now. I said, Lord, the only Lord I knew was Lord Calvert. I blink, drink a lot of that. <laughs> That's another story. This New England down south is Lord Calvin. So anyway, i make a long story short. I didn't like him. We broke up. He moved into my home. He got cut. I put him out because he was praying and reading the Bible. My wife said he must go. So we put him out, and then my wife's best friend got saved. And so she called my wife one day, Jackson, my wife's maiden name, Jackson, Jackson, Jesus is real. He's real, Jackson. He's real, crying on the phone. And she, my wife took the phone and threw it down on the bed, and the receiver turned towards me. And so I'm listening to Cheryl. My wife gets up and goes in the living room, and I'm laying there in the bed. Alvin's saved now. Cheryl's talking about Jesus now, and somebody's watering, and so on and so on and so on. So one day... A few months later, sitting in my house with a glass of Jack Daniels in one hand, and there's the joint, weed in the other, and Prince saying tonight, I'm a party like it's 1999. I said, God, if you are real, save me. Alvin said that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, that I'll be saved. Cheryl said, if I call on it, and I just begin to quote them to God. And on that couch, I sat, and God saved me. For two weeks, I took off of work. I could not even go outside. I wept every day, all day. I would just get in the presence of God and just talk to God. I didn't have a Bible. I was having conversation with God. My wife thought I had lost my mind. She called her mother and said, come get him. He's crazy. So make a long story short, 
I finally got a Bible. I want too much time to tell you. I finally read it before I ever went through the doorways of a church. I read through the entire Bible. And I read it without anybody giving me their prejudicial opinions. I used to Jesus shared their conjecture, their extrapolation, them not trying to impose their denominational influence on me. Nobody to teach me anything other than just me reading the word of God. And when I started in Genesis, I saw a verse, Genesis 1:28, the original mandate for man and God's design for man, which is the basis for my doing what I do. Jesus, the text says in Genesis 1:28, be fruitful and multiply, replenish, subdue, and have dominion. And I was like, wow, but that's not what I'm seeing in the church. I'm seeing churches with us four and no more. Church of the high steeple and few people. Church is so cold you can ice skate to your pews in the middle of July, not like this month. In the middle of July, I mean, there was just nothing happening. They were keeping Shoney's and Denny's open at night by go, leaving Bible study and going out to restaurants. They were having bowling parties and, and using other people's bowling alleys with the smoke and the liquor. They were going to the gyms and working out in the flesh factories. They were, they were complaining about the educational system and the school system. They were complaining about the blight in their communities. They were shutting the doors from Sunday to Sunday. They would have a few people come out to a Bible study. And I was just like looking like, what happened to the dynamics and the things that the Bible said we ought to be doing? and the vibrancy that we ought to have. What happened to us feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the jails and the prisons and the nursing homes and the hospitals? What about the disenfranchised? What about the widows who are widows indeed? What about the orphans? What about Matthew 25? He's not going to judge us based on the size of our facilities. He's not going to judge us based on how many degrees we have. He's not going to judge us. He said, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me naked. You didn't clothe me. So I had these scriptures, Matthew 25, Genesis 1, They kind of like intertwine. And then I read Luke 19, occupy till I come. That word occupy means to barter, to trade, to do the work of a banker. I started studying. What does he mean? He gets usury. What do you mean that we need to have increase? What do you mean that we need to expand? What are we not doing? You get a microphone, a few people, some good music, you have a worship experience, and you have what the world calls church. But I learned early that we don't go to church, and we don't have church. We are the church. And the church really is the people of God who are to take the kingdom of God to where the gates of hell are and establish God's rule. So I was like, we're supposed to be mobile, agile, and hostile. We're the representation of God in the earth. We're the feet, the eyes, the hands. We're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. This is how I came to know God. I came to know God realizing that I've been saved to be activated, that the spirit of God in my life was not for me to become famous, not for me to be on the cover of magazines. How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. That my anointing is for other people. My anointing is to help others, to support others, to loose those that are oppressed of the devil, to open the prison doors, to open the blinded eyes, to set captives free, to mend the brokenhearted. So I'm like, this is great, but where is it? What's happening? What's going on here? So my little journey through church, the little while I did through churches, was just brief before we started this particular ministry. And I visited Oral Roberts University to the prayer tower. I was pastoring. Listen, my best friend was killed in a tragic truck crash. She worked for UPS and ran into the back of a uh, shale oil truck. It exploded, singed him at the wheel. I was the first voice that this 125-year-old Baptist church heard at the funeral. And they asked me, would I be their pastor? I had no intentions of pastor, but I felt so for him and for the people that I took it. Patty LaBelle was a member of that church. And I took it. That's the reason I took it. But I, I took it. I took the church. And, and, and in taking the church there in, in, in that community, it was 36 people. We grew to 700 in six months with no music. They called me Bond the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Make his pathway straight. I was there in that community. The newspaper said, Pastor, turn the city upside down. I finally added music. First time they ever had a keyboard. First time they ever had drums. 128-year-old church, 38 members, 16 deacons, averaging 68 years of age. 
I was 29, turning 30 years old, and I took this church and transformed it. And like Philip in revival at Samaria, right in the middle of it, I resigned. And I didn't know where I was going. And that's how I wound up at Prayer Tower at Oral Roberts University. Because the town was like 30 miles outside of the city limits, 50 miles from my house. And that's not where God sent me to the country, he sent me to, a, to the city. I'm a hood dude. I grew up in the hood. I'm a hood rat. Don't let me fool you. I can't fight. This is round two, but I tell you, I can fight. <laughs> and so the deal is, is that I, I, um, I knew that this was in me, but I couldn't do it in that community. So when I called the meeting to resign, my wife didn't even know what I was going to do. I resigned. I took a trip to Oral Roberts University because I had heard about the school and the vision and the things that were there. And all I did was took a legal pad and I went up and for three days, I got on my face before God. I said, God, I'm your child. I know I am. I just resigned from the most successful church in the state of Florida. I just received an award on Tuesday, the fastest growing church in the Florida General Baptist Convention. On Sunday, I resigned. And I remember just weeping, almost similar to the day in which I, I got saved, that first three or four days. And I said, God, if you're real, speak to me. God, I've seen the way the church is going. I've seen the way people do things, God. I know this is not what you had in mind when you sent Jesus. God, I read the text where the churches are not feeding the hungry. They're not clothing the naked. They're not transforming their communities. They're shut up. The pastors are driving in from the suburbs and they're going back and forth. They're not representing you. They're not, they're not identifying with the people. And God spoke to me and for three days I just wrote down what he said. For three days I just wrote, this church will not be plagued with a drum major syndrome. You will have eldership management. You will feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the Matthew 25. You will be fruitful and multiply and replenish Genesis 21, 20. I just kept going, just writing this stuff down. And I came back and I said to my wife, I said, God told me to start a church. She said, no. I said, yes. And I said, she said, well, I'm all in. I said, great. We're going to do this. And we did it. And on the first service, I read everything that I had written down. That was my first service in that prayer town. And let me say this to you. It's exactly what you see manifest in our ministry today. So what happened? So with just me and my wife and two kids, as Rick tried to explain, we started together so that when we started the ministry, if anybody was going to come and be a part of our local church, this is who we are. This is what we do. I didn't have to reprogram anybody. I didn't have to transition traditional mindsets. You knew up front what you were getting into, that we are going to be something special and something different, that we were going to take care of this biblical mandate to do the things that God had called us to do. So to make a long story short, we began and we began to grow and God began to increase us and things began to happen. And so we decided on these four points, education, social, economic, and spiritual. You know where we got it from? Luke chapter 10, where Jesus said, when you go into the city, bless it, bless it. And then when you're there blessing it, listen to the people, eat with them, commune with them, fellowship with them. Then while you're there, heal the sick among them, meet their felt needs, and then let them know that the kingdom has come. It was Sir Francis of Sissy, I believe, told his acolytes, go into the cities and make disciples and use words if you have to. Show them the love of God. Nobody wants to know how much you know until they know how much you care. Show them and demonstrate to them that God has sent you. We went into our community. We started with nothing. My wife and I went to the grocery store and put food in the trunk of our car, parked it in the front of the building that we were renting, opened it up and started the food and clothing ministry. We took sticks with the little nails on the end of them, started walking through the community, picking up the paper on the streets in the community. I took my lawnmower, put it in the back of my little Vega, Chevy Vega, put it in the back of my Vega and drove down the street. And if I would see a house that needed lawn cutting, I would cut the yard. And when I would cut the yard, I would charge them nothing. And then I would say, hey, we're starting a church. We're just the young people at the church down here. He said, he said, who's the pastor? I said, I am. But I was cutting the yards and, and picking up the paper and doing front porch evangelism and going through the community. And we started free auto repair. We had some guys that can work on cars. So we, we didn't have 50 members. We were doing free auto repair for the community. 
Not, not the church, the community. We had barbers, free haircuts. We started doing stuff, and we became the church in the community. And then the church, the newspaper, before we were 100 members, they had this big front page list, the full service church. Well, we were able to do those things, and from there, we begin to escalate and escalate and escalate and escalate. It, it was our DNA. It was our MO. This is how we did what we did. This is who we are. We're externally focused. This is what we do. We take care of the felt needs of people, the total needs of the total man. And so God began to expand us. And as he expanded us, the needs were greater. As he expanded us, the resources got greater. As he expanded us, the ideas got greater. As he expanded us, I didn't want my kids to go to the educational school system of Jacksonville. It's one of the worst in the country. So instead of complaining about a school system, we started our own. And now we are uh, SACS accredited, middle states accredited, FACS accredited. We're the only Christian academy in our city that has all three of these accreditations. We receive full accreditation in our academy on our first submittal without any recommendation for improvement. We were such sticklers for having things right and doing things with excellence that the favor of God started just coming upon us. And before you know it, I'm like, you know what? Our people don't know anything about investments. They don't know anything about saving. I'm African-American in our community. The only thing my dad left me when he died was a loan. All he left me was a loan. And my mama alone. She left me alone and left my mama alone. I'll leave that alone. I'll let you, I'll leave that alone. So, so the deal is, Nobody had ever had anything, didn't know anything about investments in return. So we started a credit union. I was walked through by Vice Star Federal Credit Union. I was walked through, and we became an NCUA, FDIC, Federal Credit Union, where we were now teaching people to invest, 401, 403, teaching people how to have annuities and how to build, and even financing the houses of the members of our church, cars and stuff. We weren't making these little $500 loans like the old, how many of y'all remember the old credit union, you give you $500 at 23% interest. Everybody remember that? And you would run down there. I finally asked my first car, $900. I paid for it for seven years. I'm going to go over here because y'all young people don't get that. Seven years I paid for that car. Seven years. So the deal is we, we stopped doing that. And so we begin to blossom in bookstores and game room. We opened up that mall, that mini mall that you saw. In one swoop, well, check this out, Christian bookstore, exhaustive, federal credit union, law offices, men's clothing store, Greyhound bus terminal, dry cleaners, Potter's House Cafe, Integrity Financial Services, a game room that would rival Dave and Buster's, a beauty salon, a barber shop, a dance studio, a Christian academy. We cut the ribbon on this thing in one day. We cut the ribbon and open this up. Also, a full incubator for any one of our members who wanted to start a business because businesses closed in the first year and a half because of overhead. The first three years is the greatest struggle for any new business because of overhead. So we removed the fear of overhead by creating an incubator called the McLaughlin Building, and we put them in there at no cost to them. If they were profitable, then of course, as members or people in the community, they tithed back in off of the profit. That was it. And it became a popular method, and people started duplicating it around the country, helping members of their church produce, become marketplace ministers. You can minister to more people at McDonald's than you ever can at some of these churches. I tell some of my pastors, I got a couple people on staff, I say, you know what, you need to get a job. You need to go get a job somewhere where you can be effective. McDonald's hiring assistant managers right down the street. That's the most busiest McDonald's in the city. The busiest. You ought to go down there and think about it and share Jesus with the people. Go down there and love on some folks. So we, we didn't see a distinction between the marketplace and ministry. We still didn't. I, I didn't. I'm in Chapter 7, a book anointed for business by Ed Savoso that became a New York bestseller. Chapter 7 is our story in the book. Transform our world, transformation. Chapter 13 is our story. And there were other things. Wall Street Journal did a big article on us called Holy Cappuccino. <laughs> and and they, they talked about what we were doing and how this was unusual for a church and community. But here's to, 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 to their surprise. I kept saying, this is not unusual. I think this is what every church worth their salt ought to be doing. This is something that everybody ought to be involved in. Why is this so unusual to the world? Why do they see this as strange? 
And I know this still may be a tough for some of you to swallow that are sitting in here right now. And it may not even connect with, your, with who you are. But I promise you it connects with God. And I promise you that God is in it. And I promise you that, that God's getting the glory out of it. And I promise you that families are cared for and people are off the street and children are being educated. We have 100% graduation rate in our academy. I got kids, I got one of my kids right now that started with us at K4 who graduated, who got a perfect score on the SAT, who finished Notre Dame in two years and has a fellowship at Chicago University in anthropology, an eight-year program, fully paid for. He'll complete it in six years to be the youngest anthropologist on U.S. soil. And he started right there in our little tiny Christian academy over off of Normandy Boulevard and many others that have had inventions, that have done things. You saw the big kid passing out the groceries up here. You saw the big tall guy, seven foot one, 285 pounds. That's my Sasu Doka Azabuki from Kansas University, the, the best center in college basketball. I adopted him when he was 11 years old, brought him from Nigeria to our academy. We have I-20 students and brought him in. He was 6'3", 160 pounds. Now he's 7'1", 285 pounds. And he is a lottery pick this year in the NBA draft. And so we got people and stuff in Yukon and South Carolina. Four of my girls started at the University of North Carolina, Tar Heels, in one year. The, the Tar Heel fan, yes, sir. My daughter, Brittany Roundtree, starting point God. I can just name them, Hillary Fuller, all of these guys. They, we were the first school to put four kids at North Carolina in school history, but we put them there at the same time from our national championship girls basketball team. Economically, you already see it. The bistro is it. It's big. It's where you go to eat. Dennis, you guys know how to know the best. Oh, man, oxtails, collard green, macaroni cheese, black eyed peas, field peas, corn. Y'all not helping me over here. Some best bakery in town, peach cobbler. This, so, and, and, it's, and it's productive. These restaurants, each one of them do over $4 million in sales a year. And we never tended to be in the restaurant business. Our bowling alley is the best in town. Our fitness center, one of a kind. And all of the mall and all of the shops and all of the things. Social justice, I've been appointed by the mayor for social justice to be the leader, the, the faith-based crime fighter, they call me. I got a little shirt with a little faith-based crime fighter that I put on. And I, and I said this, that to say this, Rick made mention of my matriculation through Gordon Conwell. And here's why. I really believe in being able to answer uh, today's questions with today's answers and not with yesterday's answers. And I saw the way the church was going, and it wasn't good. I just talked to one of the history, church history professors. And I said, man, I believe in number one, a strong ecclesiology. Number two, new methodologies and strategies. And number three, the power of God. These three things make for a successful church. So in order for me to understand ecclesiology, I wanted to go back, and I wanted to go back into church history. I picked up Shelley's book, Church History, Easy Read. I picked it up, and it just kind of sent me on a trip. I hooked up with the campus at Gordon. I hooked up with Ryan Reeves. I hooked up and took church through the years, Reformation. I started rehearsing some things, refreshing some things, courses that I had taken, things that I had forgotten. But it was helping me to understand what was going on today. The learner always excels the learned. And I realized that in order for me to keep up with these millennials, and to keep up with these millennials, and to keep up with these millennials, that I had to be quick. I had to be on it. I had to stay fresh. I had to research. I had to shake off my, my, my cobwebs. My cognitive processes had to kick back in. They didn't want to hear me talking about the archaeological archives of the land of Edom and the Rosetta Stone to interpret Egyptian hieroglyphics. They wanted me to understand that it takes new methodologies and strategies and that the church is still the church, even though the methods and the strategies have changed. The mission has it, but the methods and the strategies. And so that's what this is all about. New methodologies, new strategies to reach the loss at any cost. This whole thing is gospel driven. This whole thing for the purpose of glorifying God, preaching the gospel, letting people see the manifestation of God. The earth is in travail for the manifestations. It's groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God, for God to reveal who his children are. So we got to show up. We got to get to the fight. We don't fight. We just get to the fight. God fights for us. That's where that power comes in. 
because you can have an intellectual exercise, you can be pragmatic and teach people formulas and steps and keys, which I refuse to do, or you can trust the power of God. David's sin was numbering all those people that came to make him king. And then as he waned in his age and as he got there, he looks around, he sees all these wonderful troops and he's not the man he used to be. So he starts counting against all recommendation and all counsel. And God smote the children of Israel as a result of it because he began to trust the flesh. I do not trust the arm of the flesh. I trust in God. My help comes from the Lord. It's the power of God. So the ecclesiology became my thing. You know, I, I just begin to go like, but you don't know what the church has been through over the years. It's been worse than this at times. Oh, we almost disappeared in the bosom of Catholicism. Oh, but we birthed forth and came out of here. And here we are today. Look at us all fragmented and flagellate all over the world. <laughs> Not being able to get along with each other at all. Biting and devouring one another. Isn't this great? This is exactly what the Catholics thought, right? <laughs> Everybody will have their own doctrine. Everybody will have their own way. And yet, with these different expressions and different doctrines, different cultures and different streams, there's still only one God. And that God is longing for us to be that one body. And that's the motivation for what I do. And that's why I do what I do. I partnered with the government. I was the mayor's. I was Rick Scott's bishop. Rick Scott held his campaign headquarters in our mall. I got a bill passed that the world said would never get passed. Over 150 write-in letters, over 200,000 calls to veto the bill. I walked into Rick Scott's office. He says, is this your bill? I said, yeah. He said, oh, that's right there. Uh -huh. See, yeah, that's how this works, huh? <laughs> just a good old boy. Never meaning no. Oh, anyway, so anyway, it was just really um, one of those things. So I still ride the city bus. I still minister to the transits. I was chairman of the board of Gateway Community Service, Drug Rehab, River Regents. I still take people to detox and sit with them all night. I still wait the next morning to see if they try to escape and be there to scoop them up and stick them back in. I haven't lost that passion and compassion that Jesus had when he looked and he saw people as sheep without a shepherd. That's how I see my community. I see them as sheep without a shepherd. I don't pastor the Potter's House International Ministries. I pastor my community. I pastor the city. I'm like Zingley. I'm the city pastor. Let Luther stay behind the wall. I got to make this thing practical. I got to make it work. I got I to I gotta take what they're thinking about. I got to think, take the scholarship, and I got to bring it into the local church and make the academy and the mission match so that the power of God could be made known. And that's another thing that we're trying to do. We're partnering with Gordon Conwell. Hey, you guys, I think if we had more churches in my urban community, scholarship is like people think that this is just an intellectual exercise where you just kind of come together. That is, no, the more you know, them that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. I'm telling you that theology is one of the most important things that people can have at this moment, at this hour in the church of Jesus Christ. Knowing God, studying God, understanding systematic theology, even being able to rightly divide the word of truth, homiletics, hermeneutics. you got to be able to handle the word of God skillfully it's an art to this thing yes but there's also power in it and when you do it right and teach it right and help people and show people you can defend against all of the heretics and all of the false teachers and false prophets that are many and abundant everywhere in the world so we got to be ready to give an answer to every man for what is the reason and hope that lies within us with meekness and fear contending for the faith and that's what we're trying to do and the best way to do it the best hermeneutic that there is, is to manifest the kingdom. If you don't believe on me for my words, how about my works? Nobody coached me. I won entrepreneur in the state of Florida in 2003, Jim Moran Business Institute, Florida State University, adjunct professor there. Never had a business course in my life. Acute wisdom that comes from God because of the burden that we had and God wanted to do something. That's called that manifold grace, where God infuses you with whatever it takes to do what you don't know how to do when you need to do it. Some of y'all don't believe you have the gift of this or the gift of that until you need to do it. 
Then you pull yourself and go, oh, how did that happen? It was God. And that's how this has happened. If I could explain it, it may not be God. But because I just try to present it and let you figure it out, that might be God. And how do you figure it out? A strong ecclesiology. Keeping up with the current trends with the new methodologies and strategies that are available to everybody. And thirdly, never forgetting, we trust in the power of God, not the arm of the flesh. Can I get three people in New England to say amen? Amen. Yeah. amen. Put your hands together and thank God for that, huh? We've got some mics around. Uh, we're going to take some Q&A. Uh, uh, Vaughn's saying this and, is his favorite part yeah. of, uh, uh, of a group. L let me ask the first. Multifarious queries. You may. And then we're going to open it up. Yes. Y you articulate an enormous amount of passion. Right. How do you keep from burning out? Worship. I think I don't prepare messages. I like prepare me. I'll give you an example. I know whoever's living above me over at that house last night, they probably thought that uh, <laughs> Billy Graham crusade was going on downstairs because of the presence of God. Um, I have a personal relationship with God. Um, I'm, I'm like, you know, the prophets of old, they were at the river Shabbat. They were trimming the sycamore trees. They had this encounter. They saw a wheel in the middle of the wheel. And, you know, they saw the Lord high and lifted up. And I had that personal encounter. So when you hear me talk about weed in one hand and Jack Daniels in the other, that's like my testimony. And that's like I know where I was. Oh, nice. so, so because I know who saved me, then I know I'm not my own. And so I know that I don't do it in my own power. I learned the rhythm of life a long time ago. Trust in God. To God be the glory. It's by his grace that I am what I am. I do what I do, not in my own power, not in my own strength, but as he leads me. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't do anything else with me, that's cool, too, because I'm not trying to accomplish anything. I don't have any personal aspirations. I'm not trying to become somebody. I'm not trying to even go somewhere before I die. I just want to rest in him. And I think resting in him is how Amen. I stay strong. Amen. Trust him. Leaning on the everlasting on. Caitlin. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Bishop. My name is Caitlin. I'm a third-year MDiv, and I love your thoughts and wisdom on if we're called to revitalize how we can do what you did without starting a new community, but actually helping to take Trans. a community mm -hmm. to that. When we came into that community, this is really a good point, they, uh, newspapers, you might have seen it on the news, even CNN, they wrote in big gold letters the N-word, go home. It was a uh, very segregated community. Mm. It was blighted, and it was very racist. But Isaiah says that when you repair the, pa the path for people to dwell in, the waste places, then shall they call you the ministers of your God. So they transformed. After we renovated, after we came in, cleaned it up, after we brought in hundreds and hundreds of people, black, white, Hispanic, after they saw the love, and they saw us loving each other, we're now the epicenter of that community, we're the second largest employer in the entire west side of Jacksonville. We're responsible for the Renaissance, and it's well documented. That's why the article read, the church that changed the city. And we are now a model for ministry, for dilapidated communities to go in and revitalize, take the burnt walls, take the broken down walls, and rebuild them. It also saves a whole lot of money. <laughs> we have a, almost a half million square feet of facilities under roof over half million, and uh, as a local church who's never had a building fund drive, a capital stewardship program, a philanthropic gift. My wife and I are the largest givers in our ministry from day one, and we get all our money from the church. And those are the type of blue collar people that we have, imagine that. No donors, and we just pool our resources. We call it design on a dime. <laughs> and we just go in and do what we do, and we've had favor. Like that mall, they were selling it. It's 48 acres, 400,000 square foot, and they were selling it for 17 million. I offered them $1 million. And uh, my, my mentor had told me, I bought the owner, skip that realtor. And I flew <laughs> down to Miami, I bought the owner, and he said, if you give me $4 million in 30 days, it's yours. The dirt was $12 million. And so I was able to, he didn't know I had a $10 million credit line just for my good stewardship. And uh, so I whined. I even pulled a race car. I'll be honest with you, okay, I pulled a race We're just poor black people. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he fell for it. And so we got it. 
at uh, $4 million. And uh, we spent about uh, 11 in the renovation of it, and it's valued at over $40 million now. So it, it was really a good. Then we bought a Southern Bell International Phone Center building, which is about a half mile down the street, vacant 11 years, renovated it. The man said, was a former seminary professor. I bought the owner. He said, what are you going to do with it? They wanted $2.9 million. He said, I said, I can't afford it. He said, well, how much can you pay? I said, I don't want to pay a million dollars. He said, okay, I bought $999,999.99. And he wrote it up at that, and we bought it. And now that's our Christian Academy, elementary to middle school. It's 60-something uh, thousand square foot. And the first building we bought was a, a dilapidated 17-year vacant auto repair shop. And we took it, took the paint and body shop and made a gymnasium out of it, took the, the, the shop with the grease guns and the pits down the middle like a firestone and gutted it out and put a 900-seat auditorium in it and then made classrooms and stuff. So we revitalized and gone into community to show the same way God repairs bodies and revitalize us, we do it with physical structures so that we can now repair bodies and revitalize people. So these are what we call sheep sheds. They come in and we equip them and we feed them, and then they go out and represent the kingdom. Anybody else? Matthew? Matthew and I had uh, lunch together the other day. He asked a lot of questions, and yeah. he, got, he got the freebie. He got, he got, he got the firsthand stuff there. Um, my sound man back there, where's the sound guy? You did absolutely wonderful. I got a little something for you, too. I appreciate you. Peace. <laughs> yes. Anybody else? Right here. Matthew. Mm. You bring all of that. Yeah. Uh, you have a ministry, okay? That's non profit. But you have businesses. Right. That's for profit. Right. So, do you have a, somebody who manages businesses so that the IRS doesn't get you? Uh, I've been. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm, that's great. That's, that's always the question because a lot of it is because of uh, misnomers and because of ignorance of church and state and taxes and non-taxes. I've been doing this for 20 plus years, for-profit businesses, and it's a simple formula. What's taxable is taxable, what's not is not. So there has never been a challenge, there's never been an issue. Uh, my budget now, I, we can it with family, my budget now is like 18 million a year as a local church, you know, and, and, and in that we have to have an audit every year and in our audit, we've never had issue whatsoever. We just separate the uh, for-profit and non-profit. Now, everything's under the umbrella of the church. Uh, two years ago, there was a shift. You can have for-profit entities under the umbrella of the church in one kitty as long as those for-profit entities' income does not exceed the non-profit entities' income. So when that got to be imbalanced or got close, we had to open up a separate CDC for the for-profit businesses. But I have an office there. I have, I have nine full-time accountants, full-time, that handle all of these resources and the separation of them and the accounting for the Kingdom Plaza Mall, the accounting for the bistros, the accounting for, all, for the schools, the accounting for all those things. All those things are for-profit. And so it's separate from the church, yet it's under the umbrella of the church. So it's a separate wing of the church. I don't have an external board or people that come in and tell me which direction to go or what to do. We have a, a it's, really we operate, you guys might like this if you pass it, we operate as a, theo, a theocracy. And my nickname's Theo. <laughs> I just thought I'd share that with you. I just said, that's free. I just thought I'd give you that. <laughs> just call me The. I mean, all right. But no, we, we do have an internal <laughs> accountability source. We have the uh, stewardship ministry, which is headed by people who are stewards, and, and um, our eldership management works as our trustees inside. So everybody that's a part of that are visionaries and have the vision with me, have courage and have the energy and have those things that you mentioned up front. Because the worst thing you can do is have somebody from the outside trying to tell you how to drive or have a backseat driver called trustee. Mm. Mm. It could be a, it could be it could be a hindrance for a ministry for a local church. So what we did is we we stay focused. Our mission is the same. Our goals and objectives have stayed the same. My our motto is simple. Anybody in our church can tell you. We want to help as many people as we can before Jesus comes back again. Notice I didn't say anything about 
winning them to Christ, and so help as many people as we can before Jesus comes back again. Mm -hmm. And that's our goal. So a 22, 23-year-old um, comes in, and you sorted that person out as possibly uh, a future pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they get from where they are to where they need to be under your tutelage? That is, um, how would you prepare a pastor today? We, we, um, we have a system in place to where um, we have mentoring programs. I have what's called a Jesus circle for somebody that I can tab and see that they have a future, somebody that will be able to pass the baton to, somebody that will be a part of leadership. Um, I think that we need to have everybody at the table. The millennials are right now the largest living generation uh, in America on the planet. So I try to have a balance of the young and the old and everybody in between. That's that Joshua generation. But I do have uh, mentoring. I have classes. Mm. Uh, actually, uh, they're able to, number one, see ministry in operation. They're able to watch us, what they behold, they want to become. A lot of people just want to get up on the pool because that's what they see. They want to stand here. But there's some things, a process that you go through, process of time, process of affliction, things that you go through in order to become what you need to become. Academically, there's some things that you need to know. So one of the things that we're doing is we're partnering with Gordon Conwell <laughs> Theological <laughs> Seminary. Hopefully, we can continue a certificate program to where we can motivate right. these people. Matter of fact, um, we, we do in-house training. We teach year-round Old Testament survey, New Testament survey and successful Christian living year round so that people who come in, they get a good handle of the Bible and the word of God and this and that. Then we give them opportunities to serve in ministry, to assist mm -hmm. other people, mm -hmm. to see what their giftings are, give them spiritual gift surveys, to find out what their liking is, what their proclivities are. And then they may not be the preachers, so, but they can still serve and do ministry. Uh, you can be a pastor and not be a preacher mm -hmm. in the ministry, you know, and be apt to teach, but not stand up and and evangelize and do those type of things. So we, we have all those, we have 66 preachers, 63 preachers. I have four bishops, former senior pastors of churches and heads of reformations that are on staff in our local church. So we have plenty of people to equip people. Mm -hmm. And I do a theology cafe, I do a training of teachers, I do a, a Wednesday morning, 10 to 12, I meet with pastors. You have spoken to them. I speak to pastors every Wednesday morning, every Wednesday morning for the last 16 years. But from the day we started, from the day we started, um, I would do Saturday morning training, ministers training, MIT, ministers in training. Not MIT like this little <laughs> MIT y'all got up here. And, and it, that's, you know, that's nothing. I'm talking about real MIT, ministers in training, Jacksonville, Florida. You know how tough it was for me to come up here to New England? Let me just throw this out here. I do chapel for the Jacksonville Jaguars and about 10 other NFL teams. But the Jaguars, I prayed to Jacksonville. <laughs> we came up here two years ago expecting to go to the Super Bowl. We were four and a half minutes away. <laughs> and then this Brady Bunch, <laughs> group of obnoxious New Englanders who just didn't know how to treat us after you won the game. And my cousins were up here, my family was up here. They said, we feared for our lives. These people are crazy and they won. So I just wanted to say to you guys, um, wait till next year. <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah. Wait till next year. Amen. But Amen. Uh, no, we do train them. And, and, and Gordon, you know, we, we want to be, and I know Scott's coming in, we want to be a feeder. The pastors that I have, many of the pastors that meet with me, 25 to 35 senior pastors meet with me every week and they rotate. Many of them don't have undergraduate degrees. Many of them don't have some of the math and sciences and stuff. But they're not going back at 40 and 35 years old to go to junior college or go somewhere to get that. So we're trying to develop and get them to where mm. they're qualified enough to be able to get into a uh, accredited seminary where they can work on an MDiv or a math or something, where they can get some uh, uh, credentials and have some weight. Because at what we're doing, when you start moving up in ministry, the banks don't just want to know how well you preach. They want to know how you trained. Mm -hmm. And they want to see some, uh, some certification, certification. They want to see some diplomas. They want to ask you, where did you go to school and who taught you? Yeah. And so we're trying to do that. And uh, I prayed Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary into Jacksonville. Yeah. I just wanted to be known yeah. that I, I prayed them there. We did not Amen. have a, a good seminary there. 
And I prayed. I said, God, we need a seminary yeah. in Jacksonville. Luther Rice had left. I said, we don't have anything. And these folk are having to leave. My kids are having to leave. Folk are going off to school. Send me something. And so it Amen. came. And Amen. so God heard my prayer. All right. So I'm in New England. I got it. Yeah. Caitlin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I learned that your church started as, uh, it began as an externally focused church. Right. And my question is, in your early, uh, when, when you started in the beginning, how did you get to motivate your members to come on board with you with that externally focused mindset? It was good. I think I mentioned a little bit that starting from ground zero is the best way to go. Transitioning people is very difficult. You mean, you know, because you have the enemies of, of growth and transition. You have tradition, you know, this is the way we do it. By keeping your tradition, you make the word of God a none effect. You have religion, man's activity, man, what man does to be right with God, and people don't like to disrupt their activity. You have ignorance, and what people just don't know. Ignorance is not a dirty word, it's just that they don't understand. And I teach people that the one-eyed man is king in the kingdom of the blind. So if you can't see it or you don't understand it, just follow somebody that, that can, that does. So when I started from scratch, mm. I was like, hey, when you come here, our new members class is not welcome to the potter's house. Our new members class is, here's who we are, this is what we do, here's where we're going. Now, do you want to be a part? That's an eight-week course. At the end of that, you make a determination about whether or not you're going to be with us and follow what we're doing. Order. The enemy hates order. So when you have structure and order and your things in place, my gifting is administration. I understand that. So we have let all things be done decently and in order. So people don't just come in. I don't take your credentials from your last church. If you came down and you told me you were an apostle or a missionary or you were evangelist so-and-so, I usually say to people, what's your name? They go, evangelist? I said, no, 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 no. What's your mama call you? What's your name? Oh, my name's Wilhelmina Johnson. Okay, Wilhelmina. Now, what are you doing here? Well, I'm a preacher. I'm in the back. No, no, no. I knew, what are you doing here? Why do you believe God has put you here? But, and then so now if you're going to be here, then there's some laws of first truth and some things that you have brought with you that you might have to check at the door. One of the things that we teach and believe, you have to be able to rethink your theology. If you're going to become a part, see, who we believe in brings us together. What we believe in keeps us together. So if we we'll speak the same thing and be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, then we can go far. But if you got a different concept about this, a different concept about that, and you're working within the congregation, that's not going to get it. I've never had a fight. I've never had a church split. I've never had an argument with a member in the history of our 30 years in this church because of the order that was set from day one. If you start right, you can end right. So I don't have to even deal with stuff because the enemy sticks out like a sore thumb when he shows up because everybody else is in line. Not made to be in line, but just taught. And they understand the flow of the ministry. And our philosophy has not changed over the years. So I didn't have to transform mindsets. I didn't have to, mo you, when you joined in, you knew what was going to happen. Then after we accomplished the first task, then it was like, my God, God's with him. It's like David. They said, David, David said, y'all come to me to help me or to hurt me? Then they said to help you, he received them. But if you, you come to, to hurt me, I can't deal with you. So if you're candid like that up front and you're dealing with people in new members classes, which I teach, my wife teaches, when you're dealing with people like that, they know what they're getting into before they get into it. And so you don't have those issues down the road, especially if, if you have the reputation that I have. A weed in one hand and Jack Daniels in no. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's just biblical order, and that's how it worked. So I never had to unlearn people. Those people don't last long. And there's nothing wrong with people who don't last long. They get mm -hmm. weeded out on their own. Jesus prunes. He's looking forward to the future. I can't have dead weight in people that's going to be a hindrance to me. Ahithophel eventually betrays. Mm -hmm. Absalom is standing at the gate. David said, it wasn't an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. It wasn't him that magnified himself. You know the story. But it was you, my own equal. So we have to be sure that we stay on the same page and that we do the same thing and that we follow the same God and we're following the same philosophy of ministry. That's what's kept us over the years, our philosophy of ministry. The guide is the Bible. It's corporate, not individuality, those type of things. 
people come before programs. Those are philosophies that keep us. So we don't have to worry about getting involved in something because we have these parameters and we have these borders and it keeps us. And so we've been kept. And everybody, when they come in, they see it and they want to be a part of it. Now it's easy because they see what we're doing. I want to be a part of that. So they come in great anticipation and wanting to know how do we do what we did and how do we continue to do it. And so we are. Same thing that happened with the seminary. Same thing can happen with any organization. Mm -hmm. When momentum, you have to ride momentum. And you've got to, you've got to have people that can validate a, a school. You've got people that can show the impact that this has had on their lives. And then people want to become a part of that. What they behold, they'll become. And so my partnership and what I'm trying to do with Gordon Conwell in our city, because for some reason people have separated scholarship from the local church, I'm trying to say, well, hey, listen, let's add this piece. Let's do this. Let's do that. So when people ask me, how do you do what you do, I can then refer them and I can even then I can say, well, you know, you also need some theological training. And I know what they might have taught you down at the first church of the Pentecostal by faith on a Sunday morning in Jesus' name. But here's what you need to know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happier than a pig and slop. I'll be honest with you. I'm happier than uh, the, the folk on the Jacksonville Jaguar team that were glad that uh, big man res uh, retired this year. I, mean, I, just, well, I just want you to know that. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that Kronk. Kronk. That's right. He's grunk. I'm, 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 so, I'm, so, I'm, I'm happy. Before things go downhill too quickly with uh, this uh, rivalry, we, we, uh, and classes begin just uh, momentarily, uh, we, we deeply appreciate inviting us into your world through your words more nearly to see the works uh, that, that are manifest, that are demonstrable. And so uh, an invitation for all of us uh, to think outside our own boxes. Uh, and so uh, a warm uh, show of appreciation. Uh.